Welcome to the program. Thank you, David. I want you to give um, Americans who are hearing this, listening to this program, a sense of what life is like in Kashmir, day-to-day -day, uh, interactions that average Kashmiris would have with one of the largest uh, military forces uh, anywhere in the world. As you, for the past few years, it's actually been alternating between between some sort of triumphalism when people get together and are able to express themselves in some political way and, uh, and, and, and a sort of widespread depression because of what they have to go through in their daily lives given, given the, the number of uh, armed forces, both federal and local police, uh, looking at the people all the time. Uh, an average day, for example, it's, it's not possible for an average Kashmiri citizen not to come across an armed soldier, whether that is a, so, uh, whether that's a person, uh, personnel of uh, the Jammu and Kashmir State Police, which is uh, which is as militarized as as a military uh, can be, or or any of uh, the central federal forces uh, deployed in in Jammu and Kashmir. There are there are camps all all across in every nook and corner of the valley. There are these small camps of uh, Rashtriya Rifles, which is the Indian Army's uh, counterinsurgency units. They spread all over. There are Central Reserve Police Force, which is another federal force of India that deployed in good strength uh, in across the valley, and the Border Security Force in some areas. So what, what generally happens, if you don't encounter a camp, or if you don't come across a check post on a, on a, on a, on a daily basis, but what happens is that you come across conversations on an average day with so many people that look here, the forces have done this at that place, the forces did that at this place. The, for, the, 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 the stories of atrocity and the forces of, uh, the stories of indignity that people suffer on a daily basis keep flying all across all the time. And this, this, this over a period you can imagine how, 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 how this understanding of what is happening around them, if it does not happen to you on a particular day, accumulates in one's mind. And you're all the time conscious of it and responding to it. And that, 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 that has affected, that produces a behavior that's almost always means uh, you're living under some kind of a fear. Even if you don't come across something indignifying to you in person on a particular day, but you, you come across stories and, and the, the stories that you've heard before that or that day keep resonating in your mind all the time. So people are, people are fair in, living in fear all the time, uh, even if it doesn't mean a, a, a very direct confrontation with, with an armed soldier on, on a particular day. And then you, an average, average person then designs his behavior, how he spends his day. Uh, responding to what is happening in his mind because of the presence of so much of the armed forces in the area and uh, it's in my understanding it's now become a uh, sort of a national Kashmiri behavior to be living in fear all the time and uh, you if you if you don't if you don't keep all that is happening around you in terms of a extremely militarized situation in your mind you sometimes feel uh, feel nervous. I mean, am I not taking care of something? So such is the extent of uh, of of this internalized fear that's almost almost now been normalized as 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 something that's that's okay that people live with on an average day. And talk about uh, the kinds of humiliations and debasement that that people uh, go through, and also, ha have there been any studies, or have you d done any reporting on the effects of this on children? Uh, there are very few studies, formal studies done by done by professionals or academics or institutions about what is happening. Uh, uh, to to populations of children of of youth or women separately or of groups of people that can be identified as groups, there are very few studies. But uh, some people have come out with uh, some understandings. For example, uh, there is this only psychiatric uh, diseases hospital in Kashmir, where the doctors have reported consistently uh, before before the, uh, the the armed conflict began in Kashmir. Uh, that hospital would receive uh, just a few thousand patients, maybe ten or twelve thousand uh, would report in a year. <coughs> Excuse me. 
that figure by the middle of 90s and by the year 2000 had gone up to 100,000 plus. That's just an indicator of uh, of what is happening to people there in terms of uh, you know the the, the mental health. Uh, and this this despite the fact that uh, most of uh, mental illnesses and uh, the mental trauma that people suffer uh, in their daily lives is not reported. Only extreme cases uh, reach the doctor. So that 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 is one indicator of uh, what is happening. And in terms of uh, what is happening to children, it's a very we've seen it in our families. We've seen it all around us. When 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 we were kids, we used to go everywhere and anywhere and play and interact with the nature, with with our surroundings, with people of all kinds. But after this this situation started, uh, which was in 1989, and it's been worsening ever since, uh, despite uh, despite uh, the armed militancy having bro been brought under control and reduced to a few hundred now. Uh, what is happening is that small kids have been restricted to their immediate families. There is much less interaction with the larger society. I mean, even in the neighborhoods, you know, there there is uh, there, are, there are kids in Kashmir who don't who don't who don't know their cousins. You know, knowing knowing by name is okay. Who don't know their cousins, for example. And we've seen the effects of that uh, in 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 the generation that's now that's now at the forefront. You know. They are, they, they, are, they are now in a position to notice, uh, you know, the, the disconnect that's been imposed on them because of the conditions, because, because the conditions did not allow them. Parents were always scared of their, their children going out. So that's, that's created, and that's also been now being, in, in some sense, being responded to by the youth. That's, that's also visible in the anger, because they, this is now the stage for them. I mean, people who, who, who grew up as kids in the 90s, they're now, they're now in their early 20s, you know, they're, they're in their late teens. They've now started figuring out what has been happening to them in their childhoods. And uh, part of the anger is also responding to, 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 to that condition and, and, and an impulse to see that change uh, for, for better. And what has the pressure and the, the stress done to gender relations uh, inside the families? Uh, again, not many studies, but uh, whatever I've been able to uh, read in terms of the reports that have been put out by professional doctors and practitioners of uh, mental health and social relationships, uh, there, there is a heightened tension within the families. There are, there are more, mari more marital discord has been noticed uh, in the last decade or so. Many professionals have ascribed it to the fact that uh, men folk and men and women separately suffer different kinds of trauma which, which they do not uh, you know, deal with when they are together in the, in the family. And uh, that, 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 has, that has accumulated and uh, produced a situation where uh, it's produced within intimate relationships within the family, it's produced you know, chasms. And that, that result in, in, in discord between not just husbands and wives, but, but young women and older women, and sometimes between the young men and older men also. And uh, if you look at that phenomenon outside the family, Kashmir today, what's happening at the, at the most frightening pace, as far as my understanding goes, what I've been able to understand as a local uh, uh, person, is that people are getting more and more disconnected with the passage of time and there are very little opportunities to con connect back. At the family level, that's, 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 that's one aspect. But at the, at the societal level, that's, that's, another, that's a much bigger, more, more, more horrifying, hor horrifying phenomenon that, I, that, that I've been able to notice. And when people, people try and look for opportunities to connect back, like, like connections, exist in a normal society then they then they begin to encounter the the problems in connecting back then they then they see how 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 reconnecting at a social level or at a political level uh, imposes costs in terms of uh, how how they then begin noticing how surveillance or by security agencies and intelligence agencies working there and there are many in kashmir uh, report that so much so that people have now begun to say look here we're being reported even from within our kitchens 
that is the state of that uh, heightened surveillance. Uh, and that, that is also, I, I believe, produces psychological consequences. As with uh, the French in Algeria and um, the Israelis in Palestine, there's an extensive network of paid informers. Uh, this too must have a, a huge societal impact because if you're just having a conversation with someone, you don't know who that person is and what you might say that could get back to the security forces. What that does is that buries trust. And uh, that's again uh, another cataclysmic thing that has happened in Kashmir. Uh, it's very difficult to find people trusting each other. I mean, if you've not had a very, very long association, you really are not sure who you're talking about. I've been, uh, because I have, I've reported Kashmir for several years, uh, you know, you, you happen to talk with people who belong to the intelligence community, you, you happen to talk to people in the official dump to the bureaucracy. Uh, I have come across several times uh, by top powerful officials who mentioned that uh, you have anything between 150,000 to 170,000 people uh, who work as informers at various levels and some some of them do it voluntarily some of them are forced into a situation where they're forced to do that and imagine in a in a in a in a, in a society which is just 7 million if you have 150,000 people informing on each other and these these could be through simple text messages or people just call or people just walk into a police office or, a, or an intelligence office or an army or a, or, or a reserve police force camp and then and then provide information and what what that has done is that that has again further produced a disconnect within within the social system in Kashmir because because uh, like you said yourself it's people are really rarely sure about who they're talking about if if it if it's not been preceded by a very very long association you know in office or in work or or socially and to enforce it, infor to enforce its rule uh new delhi has a, a collaborator a class in srinagar that undermines the will of the kashmiri people this is according to angana uh, Chatterjee. What about the elected uh, structure there with uh, Umar Abdullah as the uh, the chief minister? How, how is he regarded? As a tool of New Delhi's? Uh, very much so. Very much so. You have to understand how elections happen in, in Kashmir. There's a, there's a very clear divide. There, there are parties who fight, political parties who fight elections are called the pro-India political parties. They're called the mainstream, ironically called the mainstream political parties. And the last election happened in an environment when people had risen, people had revolted against New Delhi. The, the, the reasons that triggered that revolt uh, were, 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 a, were a land deal, uh, when the government decided to uh, transfer a, a patch of mountainous land to a Hindu, Hindu shrine board uh, in, the, in the valley. And in response to that, people just assembled. But like in Kashmir now, what has been happening consistently is that even a, a protest may start on any demand. It ultimately ends up being about independence, the end of Indian rule. So uh, the, the last elections happened after a massive, peaceful and unarmed mobilization of people against Indian rule in Kashmir. And at that time, uh, people in Kashmir thought unimaginable that another election could be held in, in, in Kashmir. You know, in the in the same uh, with the same parameters, but then elections were held, and uh, the mainstream pro-India political parties went up to people campaigning, and they said very very clearly that these elections are for managing our day-to-day -day administrative affairs, and this has will have absolutely no impact or effect on the future of the Kashmir issue or the Kashmir dispute. It was very very clear. Apart from that, a whole lot of things happened. And uh, people did did come out to vote in large numbers. Many reasons. I mean, every every small neighborhood had its own reasons why people came out to vote at at that point in time, and when none was expected. Almost none was expected. But then, when when it, when Umar Abdullah was became the chief minister after his party got the majority vote, uh, then the vote. By, in the media, as well as by 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 the politicians in Delhi, start getting interpreted as a vote for India. 
Now the parties there asked for a vote for, it was almost like a municipal election. And yet it was allowed to be interpreted as a vote for India. And what that did is that that, that further took away uh, the credibility of, uh, of someone like uh, the Chief Minister Umar Abdullah. And then events happened. And events like the two uh, sisters-in-law were found uh, mysteriously dead on the banks of a shallow stream. And people suspected men in uniform had abducted, raped and then killed them. And the way uh, Chief Minister Umar Abdullah responded to that, almost uh, going by what, what the intelligence establishment's assessment of, this, of that incident was, uh, further eroded his credibility. Then several things happened. And by now, I think uh, the majority of people in Kashmir are pretty clear what Umar Abdullah represents, and and they make no secret of it. He is called, he is called the called Delhi's representative in Kashmir. And he comes from a, a fairly distinguished family, isn't he related to Sheikh Abdullah? Yes, uh, that family is known as the first political family of Kashmir. His grandfather, Sheikh Mohammed Abdullah. Uh, uh, is actually seen in Kashmir as someone who legitimized uh, uh, the, the otherwise quote unquote illegal uh, instrument of accession between uh, the then uh, Maharaja, the autocrat Dogra, autocrat who ruled Jammu and Kashmir before 1947, that that accession between Delhi and uh, and Srinagar, and then uh, he's. Uh, uh, he was no doubt. Uh, the, he's been the most most popular and the tallest leader. Uh, of modern Kashmir, but uh, after the events of 1953, when the special relationship that uh, that was brought about between Srinagar and New Delhi through an article called the Article 370 that ex still exists in the Indian Constitution, when that began to be eroded, and he was he, he began to be seen as as someone who was instrumental in uh, in 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 bartering away the special status that that Kashmiris thought they had in within the Indian Union. Uh, uh, by and, and by 1989, when an armed rebellion broke out in, in Kashmir, uh, his his grave had to be protected by Indian soldiers and the police. Such was the uh, unpopularity of, of his legacy. And uh, he was seen as the principal villain who bartered away Kashmir and its interests to, to New Delhi. Mm -hmm. But despite that, despite that, uh, it was again his son, Dr. Farooq Abdullah, the present chief minister's uh, father, who then became the chief minister, and then he handed over power, like like his fa father Sheikh Abdullah handed over the reins of his party, the National Conference, to him. Uh, so, so people have also, you know, uh, resented that dynastic rule. But for briefly, for some time after the elections, uh, Omar Abdullah did represent some hope, some 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 freshness. And people thought that uh, matters local might be taken care of better. Lives, day-to-day -day lives, might be made easier because Omar Abdullah did make promises that he would work for removal of uh, the harsh laws or uh, or uh, very uh, discretionary application of other harsh laws. Like, for example, there's this Armed Forces Special Powers Act, which gives uh, the federal forces, the army, particularly. Uh, sweeping powers to arrest, kill on suspicion or uh, search and destroy property suspected to be used by uh, anti-India rebels. And there's this law called the Public Safety Act, uh, which is very, very draconian, which allows the state to detain people uh, for up to two years without trial and uh, without charges. He did promise that he will look at the, the the repeal or, or or discretionary use of these laws, but could not do it precisely because and then people realized he's not he's he, he doesn't have the power he's a function of uh, Delhi's thinking in Kashmir and he could not deliver on his promises and his credibility initial credibility also waned away. Now the spark that uh, ignited the initial rebellion in late 1989 was in fact rigged elections. I'm interested to know what was going on under the surface in Kashmir in the 70s and 80s in terms of uh, organizing. See, an impulse of breaking away from India has existed ever since uh, 1947, when India and Pakistan came into existence. There has been a very, very strong opinion in, in Kashmir 
that this region should have naturally been a part of Pakistan. But uh, as we know, the events of 1947 happened and the first war between India and Pakistan happened and then the line of control or ceasefire line came into existence. But a grievance, a political grievance has existed ever since in Kashmir that it was by force that India, India uh, uh, brought Kashmir under its control. And uh, since Sheikh Abdullah's party, the National Conference, was, uh, was seen as a representative of the Kashmiri's interests because it had fought against the Dogra autocracy before 1947. Uh, it, 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 was, it was seen as leaning towards India. And uh, people who resisted National Conference and, Dr. F uh, and uh, Sheikh Mohammed Abdullah uh, began seeing themselves persecuted in many ways because uh, they, they were the opposition, you know. And they were not necessarily only for Pakistan, they were also elements who, who, who wanted uh, Jammu and Kashmir to be an independent country around the time uh, India and Pakistan were born. So, <clears throat> slowly, when, when things did not, did not go in the opposition's way in any, any manner, the opposition started organizing. In, in 97, we had the first, uh, in, in, in 1970s, early 70s, we had the, the, the beginnings of, of an armed rebellion. You know, there was, a, there was a movement, a group of people, young people just came together and uh, they formed, a, formed a group and they were known as the Al-Fatah movement. And uh, it, was, it was an armed group and they, they, the, the, the idea was to overthrow Indian control in, in, in Kashmir and liberate it. But uh, <clears throat> what happened was that since, since it was not a large group of people, they were very craftily, in my understanding, co-opted. And, uh, and many members of Al Fatah, uh, you would find them in today's police force at high levels, you would find them as bureaucrats. Many of them, many of them got into the system, they were co-opted in that manner and that, that, that movement was neutralized. But despite that, uh, <clears throat> an opposition to Indian rule has, has existed. And then, Around the time 1987 elections happened, there was an understanding within the opposition that we need to get into the same space, which is the electoral politics or the legislative, legislature, legislative assembly, and express our opposition instead of, you know, creating an, uh, a movement that, that, that the system uh, that governs Kashmir can, can deem as illegal. And they decided to come under the banner called Muslim United Front. That was called the MAF, and that that it was it was a it was a spectrum of uh, uh, political bodies and groups who decided to fight the elections. And that's when that's when the trust in Indian electoral system as it operates in Kashmir was, I in my personal opinion, finally buried because they said we entered the system that is considered legitimate by New Delhi, and even even there. Our the, the elections were rigged and we were not allowed to represent ourselves or other people who believe in what we believe in. And uh, the, the, the consequence was that space for, in, in, the, in the estimation of the opposition, the space for electoral politics, the Indian electoral politics as practiced in uh, Jammu and Kashmir was finished off. It was completely neutralized and uh, I think it was only natural that people thought of uh, an armed rebellion after that. What is the space that uh, Kashmir has historically occupied in the Indian imagination? Uh, there are two things. Uh, I, I, my, my study of history doesn't go that far. I mean, in, in, in ancient India, it's, uh, people still refer to something like the Shankaracharya temple. There's a hill in the middle of uh, Srinagar city, atop it is an ancient temple called the Shankaracharya temple. People, some people still refer to that as Kashmir being part of what is imagined as India today or what was imagined India that existed before 1947. Um, it's been, uh, it's been in the, in, I think in Indian imagination it's been seen as one of the, one of the seats of Hindu learning before Islam arrived in, in, in Kashmir in the, in the 14th century. Um, but after 47, 
it has acquired a different place. I mean, after 47, 1947, uh, it became a representation of India's secular ideal because it was the only Muslim majority area that that was uh, that by circumstances remained on the on the side of India or, or was forced to be with India. So it 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 represents that that secular secular idea because. Muslim only Muslim majority area part of India not a part of Pakistan which is Muslim majority um, and and that has been that's been played up to generate fears that if Kashmir goes that means India's secular character but the idea of India is invalidated uh, but then Kashmiris are asking the question that uh, if if the idea of India is dependent on keeping a people hostage, then we don't want to be a part of that idea that can allow a people to be kept hostage for an idea to survive as, as, a, as a nation. And uh, post-1990, uh, uh, Kashmir has also played into uh, uh, the Hindu majority narrative uh, that, you know, uh, it, has, it has been one of the sources, one of the seeds of Hindu learning and must always remain. In both ways, whether whether in, whether people in India look at India as 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 a secular nation or as a Hindu majority, Hindu consciousness, na uh, a nation of Hindu consciousness, both ways they appropriate Kashmir as its own, from from taking from ancient history as as as, as a seat of Hindu learning in the in the subcontinent and post 1947 as as something that represents India's secularism. How has Delhi projected <coughs> Kashmir to the rest of the world? Uh, there are several things. Uh, firstly, post-1989, when the armed rebellion uh, began in Kashmir, it was, uh, it was projected as, as, as a terrorist movement. You know, everything was interpreted as, as terrorism. Nothing was ascribed to... Uh, to to the general masses, Kashmiris, as as their wish, it was always interpreted from the points of view of some other, which was not Kashmiri. Uh, For example, they were being manipulated by Pakistan. Uh, it's a fact that armed um, militancy was supported by Pakistan, particularly initially, to a, to a great extent, and uh, that was also used uh, against the people of Kashmir. That it's not people of Kashmir who are seeking uh, end of Indian rule in, uh, in in their in their region, but it is instigated by Pakistan. B uh, and, uh, and 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 when and when that militant movement was uh, crushed to a large extent, militarily speaking, and people changed their ways of representing themselves. Uh, in the sense, if we if we see from nine, uh, 2008 onwards, people have just come out in their hundreds of thousands and demonstrated peacefully, saying the same things that militants supposedly stood up for. Uh, then there was an attempt again to uh, to uh, to discredit this people representing themselves, uh, and 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 new new uh, new uh, words were coined. For example, the Indian Army. Uh, started calling uh, peaceful mass protests demanding political rights as agitational terrorism. Terrorism was attached to it, you know, so that so that in the Indian imagination, whatever happens in Kashmir, as uh, uh, you know, um, in the demand of the political rights that Kashmiri people have been all about for the last so many decades, uh, it it can be it can be uh, described in a terminology that justifies reprisal in the Indian mind by Indian state. So, uh, and, and uh, things have never been attributed to, to Kashmiris themselves. It's, it's always, if, 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 if the youth in, in last summer, in the summer of 2010, when, when, when hundreds of thousands of them came out on the streets and fought Indian forces with stones in their hands, uh, as soon as that situation was brought in the in the in the securitized sense under control, uh, then 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 the system again began attributing uh, attributing names name calling to that protest. For example, now in uh, police is saying that most of the most of the youth who protested in the summer of 2010 were drug addicts. So so 
it's a it's a long cycle of denial it's a denial of the, the reality on the ground in kashmir as far as uh, as far as representing uh, what is happening in kashmir to the to the outside world is concerned and in the post uh, se- september 11th atmosphere uh, particularly in terms of washington's mm-hmm. view of uh, kashmir and the rest of the world for that matter there is a, a kind of an urgent link made between uh, Islam and Muslims and violence and terrorism? Uh, in that sense, it's, I mean, th- there have been attempts to almost, uh, you know, uh, terrorism and being Muslim has, has been, ha- have become almost synonyms, but things are, things are changing. And yes, 9-11 and the events after that did help India portray Kashmir in that, in that, in that sense, in that paradigm, that Muslim majority amenable to terrorism and manipulatable by by, by a terrorist quote unquote state Pakistan, and uh, which was an ally of the United States, which is an ally of the United <laughs> States in their war against terror, but uh, but it has it has it has not disallowed uh, any other nation uh, to 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 uh, uh, India for that matter to to brand Kashmiris as allies of terrorist. Pakistan, not not as uh, uh, a U.S. ally, Pakistan. Um, but uh, in the process, what has happened is that education has spread. the the use of The use of internet has has spread in Kashmir, and people in Kashmir read more and more about how they were represented internationally by 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 India and by Pakistan and by the by by people who came from outside and wrote about Kashmir. So. By the year 2008-2010, young Kashmiris were aware of how they were being represented and it was not about them, it was all manipulation. And they began thinking about what to do about it and, and, and I, I personally think that, uh, that what, what, we see, what we've seen happening the last three summers in Kashmir in terms of huge, huge peaceful mobilization and protests is a response also to that misrepresentation of who, the, who, who Kashmiris are. Uh, and and they want to they want to now the young who, who who are aware of how they've been projected want now to speak for themselves they want to represent themselves they want to they want to tell the world who we are they don't they want to take away all the opportunities for others to 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 tell people what they are doing and who they are uh, another issue that uh, delhi raises whenever kashmir is discussed is the treatment of the kashmiri pundits the uh, Hindu community that has deep roots uh, in the valley. Um, yes, it is. It's unfortunately been uh, unfortunately been used uh, used against uh, against Kashmiri uh, majority Muslims. Uh, it's a it's a it, it is definitely a very sad tragic thing that happened in the in in, in, in 1990 when when most of the minority Kashmiri pundits the Hindus had to leave and uh, it was a set of circumstances uh, uh, for which uh, uh, both Kashmiri people as well as the Indian state and what, what it was doing in Kashmir and what, 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 what uh, people read as its intentions of what it's going to do in Kashmir is responsible. Nevertheless, a tragic thing happened, people have migrated. But, uh, but what, what I find disturbing is, is that is that this this group of people, this minority of Kashmiri pundits, Hindus, who 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 had to because of the circumstances move out, were were used as a tool uh, to batter what what even this group of minority Kashmiri pundits want to be representing. That is that is that is some of them call it Kashmiri, some of them some some of them call it uh, you know the the. The uniqueness of, of of Kashmiri culture, and and mind you, there has been a very very long history of very amicable relationship between the two communities, despite the fact that that most of Kashmiri Muslims, uh, you know, were originally their ancestry is Kashmiri Pandits because they were they were Hindus before Islam arrived in in Kashmir in the 14th century. So uh, it, it's really it's really tragic, and and the kind of politics that is that is now being done around uh, this displacement of, of this minority uh, makes it makes it harder and harder than than than, than easier 
for this community to come back to where their home is so uh, in in a sense in, in a sense they have become a tool of the right wing in in politics rather than uh, rather than uh, rather than a displaced minority whose 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 rights should be worked upon to to be safeguarded now i've heard and correct me if i'm mistaken that uh, the central government actually encouraged the pundits to leave kashmir there are allegations there are various uh, there are many people who believe that uh, new delhi appointed governor of the uh, in 1990 actually uh, made it possible for most of the kashmiri pundits to leave but these are very very contested claims the fact of the matter is that those days it was it was uh, a situation where uh, fair ruled and uh, and and it was a sudden eruption of of uh, gun toting armed militants all around and and there was this there was this beginning of an extremely aggressive military response and 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 uh, from from india and uh, it was it was a fa- it was a very very uh, difficult situation for everybody who lived in kashmir those days but what what makes it controversial and difficult to deal with is the fact that people are struggling to understand what was it that made a particular community to decide and leave and go somewhere else or to to india and the majority community the the muslims who were undergoing exactly the same who were living exactly the same conditions but did not have that option and that's that's a question that is still troubling uh, both both communities uh, in in kashmir and and there there have been there have been this contesting claims people have denied it vehemently the governor jagmohan of those days he has de- denied that he had any role but then you come across different stories some st- some some people acknowledge that transport was made available by whoever was it a state agency or who who that was nobody knows and some people say that well they heard what was being said from the mosques and they 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 saw how how some of the uh, members of the community were threatened and uh, and killed uh, and killed killed brutally in cold blood all those conditions i mean uh, it's a phenomenon that will need that will need a lot of patience to be studied and understood what exactly happened but finally it's again it's again a political consequence of a political issue uh, still being uh, still still uh, remaining a political issue now the summer of 2010 Uh, saw a, a major shift and transformation in terms of uh, tactics uh, and strategies uh, earlier you mentioned the last three summers but it seems to have become particularly acute in the summer of uh, 2010 what happened in your estimation uh, i think this is a this is a response one to accumulated anger and humiliation of the kashmiri people at the hands of the militarized situation and the military and the indian state for that matter one at one level it's a response to that at another level it is it's the it, it it's a it's a it's a reaction it's a reaction to uh, the unacknowledged demands of the kashmiri people for the resolution of the status quo kashmiris have been wanting to make it clear ever since uh, the cease fire line or the line of control as it's being called now has come into existence that that needs to change kashmiris want an end to political uncertainty and uh, several things have happened uh, you know fr- from the side of kashmiri people to deal with it elections armed militancy uh, other other mobilizations but nothing has changed and what happened post 1990 was that that everything was being dealt with militarily and so much so that now in kashmir uh, uh, in my in my personal understanding it is militarism that rules there is uh, uh, nothing is guided by either law or by policy it is uh, uh, everything everything is sought to be dealt with by intimidation and 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 people this young people who who we saw explored uh, on 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 the on the streets in the summer of 2010 have grown up in a in an environment of extreme fear and i think uh, i think this generation is beginning to overcome that fear or maybe it has it has normalized you know or that atmosphere of fear has normalized itself and that's now become the basis and people want to break free of that uh and and 
which which means essentially that people people want to be living dignified lives and they just want to they just want to break free from the militarized conditions that they've been living with and we're talking about this generation who's not seen anything but 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 a militarized kashmir and and which 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 plays out in all kinds of brutal ways that you can imagine you've written that the new generation of separatist leaders seem to have made a conscious decision not to take up arms a move to retain moral supremacy over indian occupation this you say represents a major shift in tactics i believe so uh, and i think i think it's uh, it's been it's been a long process of internalizing uh, what armed rebellion achieved and what it did for kashmir uh, if there was a belief in 1990 that it was possible to possible to uh, th overthrow indian control of kashmir through an armed rebellion people have now uh, realized that uh, it was not it was not militarily possible and it was not an achievable military objective and uh, people have also realized over the period of time that uh, 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 what was sought to be crushed militarily has in fact become more entrenched and more widespread and more pronounced and more clear in 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 people's minds and uh, uh since uh, kashmiris also have lived the experience of uh, of of a military response or a military reprisal uh, in to 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 their armed uprising uh in the process they've also discovered the power of peaceful protests so uh if there was a silent debate within kashmiri society particularly the young people after the events of uh, 1990 Uh, about uh, what an armed insurgency or armed militancy or armed rebellion could achieve over a period of time and post 911 also helped clarify a lot of thinking about it is is that it was on it's it can only serve a purpose of making a point of creating a political space that has to be used in in different ways and i think i think the 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 young generation the new generation of kashmiris realize this fact more clearly than any other that it is peaceful mobilization around ideas uh, that that will that will that will get them uh, their political objectives without without denouncing what the armed rebels stood for i think i think i think they represent a change in terms of tactics rather than the objectives the objectives remain the same the tactics have changed and have you discerned any interest for example in gandhi or martin luther king junior or nelson mandela and the tactics that they used in different situations of course uh people have talked about it uh but i don't think uh, any of uh, any of these uh, big characters in the, in in the world's history uh uh find too much resonance in today's kashmir because uh, because because kashmiris realize that uh, that 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 these that these men existed in different times and and did not have to face up to the kind of uh, militarized control structures uh, that that they encounter uh, you know in 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 kashmir uh, Uh, people are struggling people are struggling to evolve evolve new ideas uh, that may resemble what uh, what mandela or gandhi have done in their times uh, but but the, i haven't still discerned a, a direct mass resonance to uh, to uh, to either either gandhi or uh, or to mandela but but uh, people are trying to create responses as uh, from from the situation that they that they find themselves in they have to respond they, they 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 have to respond both to both to military control as well as misrepresentation and 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 deceit so it's not a straightforward situation where 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 uh, where direct inspiration could be had from one such historic character now you said the whole generation has grown up since the rebellion started in 1989 in this atmosphere of what you call deepening militarization uh, in kashmir What can you say about uh, their class background, level of education, and political awareness? Uh, they come from all classes, as far as I understand. They are definitely better educated than uh, than than uh, the youngsters of 1990 were who picked up the gun. They are definitely more aware of what is happening, not just around them in Kashmir, but around the world. Uh, uh, there uh, and and. Uh, 
they they're also they're also acutely aware of uh of of what they're what they're looking for they're, they're more clear about what they're looking for than 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 their previous generations and i think uh, i think they're also aware of the fact that whatever they have done so far in terms of representing themselves and protesting uh it is still not produced any new politics both in india about kashmir and within kashmir about kashmir so i i think i think that i think these people that we saw on the streets fighting indian forces in the summer of 2010 are uh are are, are still are still uh, are still struggling to believe in in one way in 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 one single way that can that can that can help them achieve the objectives of political rights the level and scope of the summer 2010 um Uh, rebellion caught the attention of Congress President President uh, Sonia Gandhi. Uh, she made the comment, "We must ask ourselves why people in Kashmir are so angry and hurt." Uh, if after 20 years of what's been happening in Kashmir, the President of Congress Party still needs to ask what makes people of Kashmir angry, it's a it reflects it reflects a. it reflects a very uh, pathetic understanding of what is happening in kashmir if if it's a genuine genuine statement that comes straight from the understanding of what mrs sonia gandhi may have of kashmir uh it's not it's not difficult to understand how people how people inside inside a huge jail can feel i mean for me uh, both as a journalist and as as a kashmiri Kashmir is nothing nothing more than a huge huge jail today where uh, where uh, uh, where there no rules apply where every rule applies where where uh, where the only objectives of of the state are to uh, are, are, are to control a people rather than anything else i i i i i mean i i wonder i wonder at statements like these when when indian politicians say uh, what is it that kashmiris want what is it that makes them angry and i think it's the it's the most naive statement that can come from any any politician and and to me it doesn't reflect it doesn't reflect a lack of understanding of what happens in kashmir i think it it it, it reflects more much more much more than that uh uh the the willful deliberate ignorance of uh, what the indian state is doing in kashmir is there a unified uh, conception of azadi of of freedom or are there differing views on that well on the surface there there is uh, there, there there is a view that jammu and kashmir should be an independent country between india and pakistan there's another view uh, most predominant in uh, in 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 kashmir valley uh that 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 kashmir should have been a, a part of pakistan but but things have been changing uh if there is if there is clarity about one thing and unanimity about one thing in the majority of those who protest in and rule in kashmir that is that people should be allowed to decide about their future uh and and when and when people demand a definition of what people what what kashmiris mean by azadi i think that's asking for too much at a time at a time uh, you know these questions can be asked during transitions not not when not when a military aggression is on uh, for a, for a people and i think this is an unfair question to ask at a time when there is no space for free discussion when there's no free when there's no democratic space for engagement in in terms of ideas and arguments and and there is when there's not even space available for uh, simple political protests you know when 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 everything is being dealt through uh, military means this is an unfair question to ask this question should be asked if a space is allowed to evolve and that would that would call for a transitionary period where people can think freely and express freely and that's that's when this question becomes a genuine and i, and I think I think asking this question is like uh you know you 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 put a person in chains and ask him uh, well can you can you demonstrate if you can fly it's not possible so then perhaps along those lines uh, discussions about the status of Ladakh uh, another part of of uh, Jammu and Kashmir state and Jammu itself uh, would not be appropriate 
no, I think the time time to talk about these things is always always appropriate. Uh, but uh, but there's a, there's a problem, you know, when 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 you talk about the people of Ladakh, you don't know whether you're talking about people of Leh, you're talking about people of Kargil, which is two regions within the Ladakh area. One is Buddhist majority, another is Muslim majority. Uh, and when you look at the Ladakh area as such, uh, you know, demographically, then it is again Muslim majority. When you look at Jammu, barring barring three districts, then it's again Muslim majority. And it's a it's a very wrong thing to uh, to to look at Kashmir in terms of the demographics of three regions and in terms of the religious composition of the populations of the three regions. I think I think it doesn't help to say. Uh, Buddhist Ladakh, Muslim Kashmir, Hindu Jammu. I think it doesn't help to say uh, that that these three regions have uh, very clearly different aspirations. I think, I think, uh, uh, I, I think that there should be political instruments to measure these things rather than rather than demographics based on religious denominations. Uh, you know, and 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 then and then uh, design or, or 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 interpret aspirations of these three regions on the basis of what the religious con composition is. And I think it also contradicts the the idea with which with which Indian polity approaches Kashmir. You know, if if it's a, if it's a secular point of view, then uh, why is it why is it okay to look at Kashmir in terms of one region is one religious domination, another is another religious domination, another is another religious domination. And I, I think I think that's a that's a that's a contradictory a contradicting approach to understanding the the uh, aspirations of people there. And I think I think this is also uh, this also somehow at some level uh, reveals a certain amount of uh, deceit in uh, you know or or misrepresenting Kashmir uh, in a in a deceitful manner uh, by 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 describing these. Uh, uh, aspirations to religious groups alone. Do you think Kashmir is seen through a colonial prism in the rest of India, particularly in the media? Uh, I think so. I mean, uh, not 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 in the sense in which colonialism operated and was understood, uh, <coughs> you know, uh, before uh, the the partial decolonization of the subcontinent. But yes, in a in a in a in in a neo-colonialist sense, uh, definitely yes. Now, New Delhi has, in response to the uprisings of uh, the summer of 2010, has announced uh, new initiatives, new interlocutors. Are these, uh, in your view, cosmetic uh, approaches, or they're they are actually substantive? Uh, from my experience of, uh, from my understanding of what the interlocutors have been able to do and what they have been doing and saying, uh, there's little doubt in my mind now that uh, these are cosmetic efforts. Because how can three people, after speaking to, even if they've spoken to a few thousand people in Kashmir, how can they come up and say that most people in Kashmir do not want Azadi? Whatever Azadi means for them also. How can they say that most people in Kashmir want strengthening of Indian institutions rather than anything else? While as what we have seen on the contrary, very, very clearly being articulated on the street and, and also in, 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 in cyberspace. Uh, Facebook has now become uh, one, of the, one of the nice little uh, majors of how Kashmiris, young Kashmiris are thinking. How can they say that? And when and when and when people who are expected to be neutral and as and as and are supposed to be suggesting ways of approaching a political solution of the Kashmir issue, how can they say things that are patently statist in their, uh, you know, as far as Indian position on Kashmir is concerned? So I don't think these efforts are going anywhere. Now Obama came to uh, India in November of uh, 2010. Did he have anything to say about uh, Kashmir? Uh, he did not say anything un until the point at uh, a press meet, a journalist asked him a question and, and then again he did not say much. Uh, Obama said pretty much the same thing that the US officialdom has been saying about Kashmir that Indian, we encourage India and Pakistan to talk and uh, I really don't know what they, what they mean by this. Uh, uh, Obama, of course, apart from that, uh, did not mention Kashmir anywhere during his address. Uh, 
and uh, his interactions here, uh, besides, of course, uh, making pitches to sell beers. And no comment about what one human rights group calls in Kashmir a, a reign of uh, repression. I understand also that there was a very um, significant WikiLeaks document um, dealing with uh, Kashmir. Can you talk about that? Uh, yes, it talked about it talked about uh, what every Kashmiri has known for 20 years to be happening and even more. And nobody outside of Kashmir ever acknowledged it, that torture is widespread and uh, a majority of the young and including sometimes very old, 80 year old people have been uh, put through uh, the worst forms of torture in Kashmir. It was the first time that uh, some kind of a confirmation from outside Kashmir came that uh, that the Indian state was fully aware and was uh, uh, of the widespread torture that federal forces and 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 the state police was uh, has been had been doing uh, in, in Kashmir in, in in the hundreds of uh, camps that people get detained in and uh, it it must have been very embarrassing uh, for, for those people who've been maintaining that uh, uh, India has an impeccable record of human rights in Kashmir, and uh, uh, but uh, but 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 you know Kashmir in in Kashmir it was uh, it was a it was it was for the for the for the for the young literate generation it was a moment of catharsis, uh, perhaps for the first time that somebody from outside of this region has uh, know and have acknowledged and have told the world that look what has been happening to Kashmiris. And have the revolts in Tunisia and Egypt with the subsequent overthrow of deeply entrenched regimes uh, inspired or animated uh, the struggle in Kashmir? Uh, it has definitely uh, informed the discussions uh, in, in Kashmir. And people are definitely, the, the, these developments have definitely energized debate. And uh, people are talking about the differences between what what people in Tunisia wanted and what they did for it, what people in Egypt, for example, wanted and what they do do for it, and what people in Kashmir want and what they ought to be doing for it, they are they are they are they are drawing inspiration, but at the same time they're also uh, they're also trying to understand the differences in ter in terms of uh, situation. For example, a major thread of discussion uh, post uh, uh, Tahrir Square in Kashmir has been. Uh, uh, look here, Egyptians uh, just wanted change. We 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 are we are we are looking for liberation or freedom in the first place. They uh, they exercise their right of right of asking for change. We don't even have that right in the first place. So it is enriching the debate. Yes. To get back to sort of the uh, texture of the occupation, there's a there's a village in Kashmir you've reported on Pahelam. A village that has been under curfew for uh, more than uh, two months. What does that mean to be under curfew? What is it in terms of can people not go out? Can people not go in? Uh, this village, perhaps you're talking about Palahalan. It's a village in Baramulla district. Uh, it's a it's a it's a it's a large village, and uh, f for me, I mean, uh, it 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 represents uh, what is happening all across. Uh, rural Kashmir today and during the last summer it was under curfew for 39 days at a stretch which doesn't mean that that was the only only days that that people uh, spend under curfew and when you when, when curfew is formally imposed it means that nobody can come out there are shoot on site orders if you're seen you can be shot at and that's legitimate uh, these you simply can't go anywhere and and the people of palhalan for various reasons have been dealt more harshly than 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 any other kashmiri village perhaps because there was a good number of armed militants initially in 1990s that came from palhalan and Palhalan has always consistently, whatever the state of repression or the state of military response or the or 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 the state of militancy, whatever side has been, uh, you know, on top, Palhalan has always resisted very vocally Indian rule of Kashmir, and uh, the the consequence has been that uh, you uh, people of Palhalan 
during last summer could not even travel in buses when it was when the transport was plying from from one area to another the the bus even buses uh, public transport buses would be stopped on the highway and they would simply check i cards and if it was palhalan written on that those people would be dragged out of buses residents of palhalan students who went to write exams they were dragged out of exam halls uh, because because it has developed a very very clear character which will not accept indian rule of 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 kashmir so and and they face the consequences and palhalan is not palhalan uh, palhalan perhaps represent an extreme of uh, of that thing but but there are, there are there are many areas rural areas villages in kashmir sopor is another area for example which is seen uh, which is seen both heightened militant activity and heightened uh, you know military control uh, uh, by by the by the state side uh, the the condition there is the same the new york times at the end of uh, 2010 ran a, a something called the year in pictures and i was i was very interested because uh, it reveals something of a lexical uh, transformation that i hadn't noticed before in the mm. us media or in the us or or particularly the new york times it said that um, a young girl uh, mourned the death of a cousin in shrinagar uh, who was shot by indian security forces in indian administered kashmir now that's what i was interested to see that uh, the new york times is now using that particular term so talk about this uh, lexical shift uh it's it's very interesting and i think i think it was made possible by not just the events of uh, the summer of 2010 uh but but also the fact that people for the first time found an opportunity to report themselves what people were doing in kashmir you know was not only uh, a function of how it was represented by the indian state or the mainstream media or uh, or anybody but they were for the first time using social media like the youtube the facebook the twitter and they were reporting themselves and uh, it it really did travel uh, far and wide and for the first time some people outside of outside of kashmir realized uh, oh well kashmir is not only about what the indian mainstream media or the indian state or the pakistani state or anybody has been telling us but there's something else also happening because uh, because because kashmiris could through social media report themselves for the first time and i i i think that made a huge difference and the events of 2010 summer perhaps represent that 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 discontinuity of kashmiris being always represented by somebody else except themselves and tell me a little bit about yourself how did you get involved in journalism and uh, who inspires you uh i am i am a kashmiri myself uh, i was uh, I was trained uh, I I studied uh, all my uh, I had all my education in Kashmir except the last year of my master's degree which by by some uh, strange set of coincidences happened to be in Jamia Millia Islamia University in, in in New Delhi there's a department of mass communication research center there and uh, it just happens that when I was when I completed my masters uh, the armed rebellion in in Kashmir uh, this broke out and uh, it was a time when when i was like fully geared and mentally prepared to uh, sort of jump out there in the sea and do something for myself and prove something to my own self for myself uh but what was happening i and, and i came to delhi to work and what was happening back home in kashmir was uh, not just disturbing and unsettling and uh, uh it it also it also energized the urge to uh, do 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 something more uh, but trust me between 1990 and 2004 i was only uh, an absentee kashmiri i visited a couple of times every year and i thought i understood what was happening but when i finally went back home to kashmir in 2004 and and, and started working out of that place i began to realize what had happened and even even being a kashmiri and and a regular visitor my family still large family still living there how far removed i was from the ground reality and and the and the horrors that people were living in kashmir for sort of so many years and from 2004 onwards i began understanding uh, 
uh, I began understanding the real nature of, of the horrible situation that Kashmiris have found themselves in for so many years now. Uh, and I think uh, uh, it may be an exaggeration, but I think after I started living in Kashmir after 2004, I think I became a journalist after that. I think I think uh, everything else that I did till then in the name of journalism was kids play compared to what's happening in Kashmir. Given what I'm trying to say is that I find I found it very difficult to write about the the truth of Kashmir because it was being it it had it has almost been relegated to uh, repeating the official truth. And it was so difficult to write about the ground reality because it was it was difficult to find attributions for ground reality. People were always afraid of being being quoted as as informing you, as saying something. And people always talked in between the lines. And that 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 that, that was a test of that that was my that was my basic first test of journalism. Uh, and uh, regarding what 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 inspired me to become a journalist, I think. I think it's uh, it's it's my own little understanding of uh, what what truth is or may be and how how it how it how it is uh, how it is represented. When I see the when I see the gulf in between and the contradictions, I think that provides a constant source of inspiration to to journalism. Thanks very much for your time. Thank you very much, David, for talking to me. I'm David Barsamian. Thanks very much.